All right, stop and restart. So these videos are for one chapter at a time. Uh, farming, right? Speaking of farming, um, wheat and dairy were some of the big early crops. Uh, you know, again, I was looking up, uh, you know, in the, in the early days of, of wheat harvesting, you know, these were considered uh, high tech and these were considered, oh wow, we're mechanized now, right? But it was still mostly horses uh, doing doing the, the hard work rather than an engine. Um, well, in the book says that uh, wheat spread westward like a giant wave. Um, you know, people would start growing wheat and it quickly exhausts soils. And so what people would do, rather than try to figure out a different crop or figure out a way for it to not exhaust the soil, they would just pack up and move further to the west until those soils were kind of used up and they move further to the west. Because um, wheat being a, a very popular, um, easy to grow crop, but uh, it does take a lot out of the soil uh, and it wasn't until uh, after the Dust Bowl, really, that farmers started to rotate crops so that you would, you would grow things that replenish the soil for a while, uh, rather than just, because wheat was, was making the most money uh, and you could grow other things, hay and whatnot, uh, but they just didn't make as much money, so people just didn't wanna, wanna farm them until they kinda had to. Uh, people know much about the Dust Bowl, I learned about it uh, back in high school. I it think. was around the 1920s, I think, during the Great Depression. Um, the topsoil started, it was a really bad drought, and then the topsoil kind of was all loose because of the farming, and it just got picked up by the wind, and it created a big dust storm. It was horrible. Yeah. yeah. The native plants were killed in order to grow stuff, and then they stopped growing stuff, so nothing was holding together the soil, so mm -hmm. all the dust. And it also were, um, it affected Minnesota to some extent because, like I said, the soils were, were exhausted. But even further west, where the soils are just even less less high quality, it was even worse. Uh, those were places where uh, you just shouldn't be growing those crops. Uh, and they, they couldn't tell the weather as well as we do now, even though it seems like these days we can't tell the weather that well either. But... Um, so yes, they would, they would still plow up the land and hope for rain and it would blow and topsoil and, you, and, and they would just keep on doing that, keep on plowing it up, hoping that the next week or the next day would have some rain uh, and it wouldn't come. And actually, uh, Washington, uh, D.C., they debated about whether or not the Dust Bowl was a real problem until one of the big dust storms cover DC in a layer of, of dust. And then they're like, oh, I guess. And that's one of those things, right? Until something is in someone's face, they won't see it. <clears throat> um, not, not from the book that I looked up, just looking at the different train routes uh, as they began opening up through time. So total area planted in wheat in peak year. This is another uh, map from the book. Um, you know, again, like I said, the if, if you want to have wheat every year uh, and you're not going to rotate your crop, you've got to spend a lot of money. Uh, and so a lot of places just started doing that. Um, but like I said, also rotating other crops uh, is more sustainable. <clears throat> Um, let's see. Well, the, the infrastructure that was put in place for sawmills and lumber, uh, that, those were still things that had energy that you could use for all kinds of different purposes. So a lot of those changed over, because again, also there wasn't the big lumber industry so much anymore. So I switched over to, to wheat mills or uh, grist mills, the term used in the book over and over again that I haven't really heard in other places, but grist mills, which is just any type of any type of uh, seed from a plant that you're gonna ground up, right? Uh, 
1890, uh, the milling district, which was uh, downtown. Downtown is where uh, St. Anthony Falls, and we have all that energy from St. Anthony Falls. See the old trains bringing in uh, wheat. Um, let's see, another, well, a bunch of uh, charts from the book. In a nutshell, these are showing kind of when the peak was for wheat um, and the decline through time, right? Soil exhaustion, uh, you know, talking about dust bowl period of time, right? Uh, this is just another picture of the milling district downtown. Um, Mill City Museum is over here. Anyone been to Mill City Museum? A couple people, all right. Uh, well, now there's there's uh, a big ruins area because, of course, there's a, uh, a flour mill. Uh, flour, well, all right, these are mills for grinding up seed into flour, right? Uh, and if you've ever done anything with flour, uh, drop some or something, right, it gets in there easily. It's very light. Uh, and so this was just something that was a byproduct of, of, of grinding up this stuff, that there would be lots of flour in the air. Well, if you, if you took a bunch of flour and put it in the air, and then you tried to light it, it would burst, it would, it would go. Uh, and there weren't a lot of safety precautions in the early days, and so at a certain point, that happened, uh, and, it, and it blew the top off on the buildings, but you could still visit the ruins. It's a nice little park now. <clears throat> You know, uh, St. Anthony, uh, St. Anthony Falls, St. Anthony was its own separate city other than Minneapolis uh, originally. Um, a lot of the areas that are around Minneapolis that we think of just neighborhoods of Minneapolis, they're originally, it's tough to think of them as suburbs, but they were considered suburbs because they weren't the central city. Uh, but what happened through time, and this happened with many cities in the U.S., Minneapolis annexed those different cities because uh, it wanted that, that tax base, right? It's like, well, St. Anthony, you know, they, they have power and they have mills and they have all this stuff going on. Um, and like I said, this happened in most uh, North American cities where as, as the income spread out from the city, they would try to annex and that stopped basically when suburbs started getting wealthy enough to have enough power uh, politically to just say no. Uh, so that's why, that's one of the reasons why, uh, <clears throat> well, you have, you have more or less sprawl in different places too. Uh, there's lots of cities, like when LA was growing, it never really was able to annex any of the suburbs around it because they had too much political power just like right away. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I just looked up some of the old smaller mills just to kind of see what they looked like um, And actually if you're ever driving out and about in small towns, you could still see some of these little mills here and there uh, It's it's difficult to conceive that you know This used to be the the center of like a little kind of semi-industrial area in the small town and that that's how spread out things used to be because water was the power source, right? <clears throat> Um, what well, we've already talked about before about how river transportation had seasonal limitations that we all know as Minnesotans. Uh, so there's a, a switch over to, to rail transit, uh, and then within Central City, uh, trolleys. Trolleys started being a way people got around. Oh, this is a picture of those runes I was talking to you about. Um, if you go to Mill City, I don't, I forget which building the museum itself is in. Uh, but you can go to the area that was exploded. Um, the book talks about how it's kind of difficult to, to measure how much farmland there is versus how much cropland there is because of these different definitions. Um, although small, t small towns themselves are declining uh, and in some measures uh, farmland is declining while cropland uh, isn't or is declining very slowly and again it's because it's how you define these things 
you know, for example, here, farm line, any place that's produced and sold minimum of $1,000 worth of product, right? Well, that could include all kinds of very small and not very productive farm areas, right? So it's tough to measure how much output there is or isn't. Um, actually, this map is a good, good way to kind of see that out and see that there's the majority of, of farmland of, as percentage of land. Not to say there still isn't plenty of farming over in these areas. It's not as much. But you know what this crop is? Yeah, it's hay. You probably see these out all the time. <clears throat> uh, so a lot of that cropland uh, used for hay. Uh, hay is, is less intense uh, on the land and on the soils. And although it gets less money, um, it's not going to destroy your farm, right? It's not going to destroy your cropland. Um, not just that, but it became part of a normal crop rotation, hay and uh, oats. Um, although hay and oats, uh, once we stopped using horses for everything, there is, there is a lot less demand for hay and oats, as you can imagine. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and then uh, corn started coming uh, much later. Uh, corn, uh, it wasn't really until we figured out how to basically store it in a way that it didn't like rot and go bad. Uh, that took a bit more more time than, than wheat uh, and some other crops. Uh, oh, soybeans, another good crop for rotation because they will put nitrogen back in the soil that wheat is taking out. Um, and there's there's good demand for soybeans these days. Soy products. I don't see anything else from this map. Oh, well, not map, but this chart. You see how corn kind of taken over um, in no small part this this time frame because uh, increasing subsidies for corn increasing subsidies for corn uh, there 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 was an effort to try to um, use more corn fuel for things right uh, 